who are left behind. What is the hope that he has as we remember the miners in Pennsylvania just a few years ago being buried and sending out the message, is there any hope? And for those who are in the submarine who tapped out Morse code, is there any hope? Is there any hope? Sometimes we can be easily caught into a hopeless state. That's what happened to our person today, Mary. Mary was a person who was devoted to her Lord. And yet, she was the last to leave the cross in Calvary, and she was the first to be at the tomb. And Mary had so much struggle and doubt and questions. Mary had gone to the tomb that morning to embalm Jesus' body because she had seen him dead. And notice what John says in our scriptures today. He says to us, and he's a philosopher, John likes to bring in these little phrases to let us know what's really the temperament of the moment. And he says, And now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. And what... The John is telling us is that there was a darkness holding over her heart and holding over the disciples' heart because Jesus was dead. And they were overcome with this emotion and sadness that Jesus had not, it was dead and that their time with him was over. And she sees the stone that had been taken away and she send, ran to Simon Peter and to the other disciples and says to them, they have taken away my Lord out of the tomb, and they do not know, we do not know where he la- they laid him. There she is. She's thinking somebody has robbed the grave. Somebody has robbed Jesus. And what is interesting about this whole thing, she is a woman of pure faith and devotion to Jesus. And yet she has a hard time because she didn't consult the scriptures like the disciples. For as yet they had not understand the scriptures that he was going to rise from the dead. And so the disciples went away again to their home. It, What are we going to do? But Mary stayed there. Mary was there with the deep devotion, the love, the faith. She wanted to believe something, and yet she was looking for Jesus because she wanted to honor him in his death. And even at that moment, even in the darkest moment of her life, her faithfulness to Jesus was not ended. How many times has it been in our own lives that it's easy when things look dark, when our prayers are hitting the ceiling, when we don't feel God is understanding us, that we find that we can still be faithful? When your prayers have not been answered, do you continue to pray as Mary did? Do you find yourself maybe neglecting the scriptures because you just didn't feel good about it or you weren't getting anything out of it? How about church, that we miss it because we just... It just seems like we're going through the motions because we're stung by hurt or something or we're distracted by life. And here we find Mary. Mary by the tomb. And she's weeping. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping and so as she wept, she stooped to look. She was investigating, trying to figure out what happened to Jesus. She wanted to understand where he had gone because this was going to be part of her fulfillment of grieving process. And in the darkness, she faces the reality of his death. Mary had been there before, though. You see, Mary understood this. You see, Mary was a person who was a wounded person. And she knew the hope that Jesus had put inside her one time before. Some people believe that Mary was the prostitute who was caught in adultery and they brought to Jesus. But there's no real biblical affirmation to that. Some believe that she was the sinner woman who had been brought to Jesus and that she came and wiped his feet with her hair and and an ointment and she prepared his body. But there's no evidence for that. But what we do know about Mary Magdalene is this. Some of the women who had been healed of evil spirits and sicknesses, Mary who was called Magdalene from whom seven demons had gone out. Mary was oppressed by demonic activity. She was ostracized by the people in public. She was put down and she was put away. She was an outsider. And yet when she came to meet Jesus, Jesus took her out of the demonic bondage and brought her into magnificent life and gave her a whole new hope for life that no one else had ever done. And this Mary, because he had freed her so much, because she sensed it so much inside of her, that because of that, 
She was the most devoted disciple that Jesus had. Here's Mary, willing to risk her neck while all the other disciples had run for their lives. Mary is standing where with Jesus' mother, putting herself on the line to even be put to death because she followed this guy. She's willing to do that because of her love and because of the intensity, because she had been broken from the bondage by Jesus. She was willing to die for him. She was the one who waited and as they brought his body down off the cross, she went with them and put him in the tomb and anointed his body with oil. And she was going back that morning, Easter Sunday morning, to do the same thing. Her devotion did not wane, but she was going to anoint his body again. And in the midst of that, we see Mary, the last at the cross, but the first at the tomb. Mary was that devoted disciple. She was willing to stand there with Jesus. And what a wonderful thing we have here. It's interesting, is it not, that God chooses some of the most unlikely people to be his best representatives. Maybe some of you today don't feel like you could be a good representative of Jesus. But let me tell you something. Mary was one of Jesus' best representatives. Jesus had taken Mary out of the brokenness of life and put her in a new level that she became the apostle to the apostles she was the one who preached the gospel to the apostles she was the one who took the truth that jesus had risen first to the disciples who were all hiding in the upper room you see and jesus does the same thing for you and me when he puts a call on your life when he puts you on 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 his side you are given a new identity a new opportunity to be different and to be there. And the Bible tells us that God doesn't take the, the stars of the world. He takes those who realize that they need to trust Him every day like a Mary, who are fully devoted because they know what Jesus has done to release them from their sin and their guilt and give them the promise of eternal life. You see, Mary had the light of Jesus Christ on her and opened her eyes up. And because of that, she's devoted. As the, verse 5 says, the light shines in darkness. The darkness had been in her heart. The demons had controlled her, but Jesus had broken her free. But now, she had stepped into a relationship with him and she wasn't going to let go. She was committed to Jesus, fully devoted follower. And the word of God asks us, are we there? Are we there fully demoted to Jesus because of what he has done to release us from the bondage of our own sin and be free to live a new life? Then the second thing, are we willing to step up? You see, Mary had to step up. She had to step beyond her emotions because we all know there's emotions that happen to us in life that throw us for a loop. She was distraught about his body being taken. And notice the angels come to her. They're sitting there and they say, Mary, why? Why are you crying? Why are you weeping? You would have thought that Mary would have got it seeing two angels sitting on the tomb. But she didn't. Because she was so overwhelmed with her emotions. She couldn't see beyond her emotional life. She was overwhelmed. And Jesus also was behind her. And she doesn't recognize him. Look at what the Word of God says to us about Jesus being there too. It says... And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be a gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. She doesn't recognize Jesus. Now I was wondering about this. I'm thinking, why would she not recognize Jesus? Well, she was overwhelmed with those emotions, yes. Maybe it was because, too, she was so convinced in her mind after she saw Jesus dead and burying him that it just didn't fit her context. Have you ever been in a context where you see somebody else that you see in a different context and you don't recognize them? I do this with police officers. I see them in their uniform, and I'm thinking, I see them in Walmart, and I'm saying, now, I know that guy from somewhere. I know that gal. I did that once here. I made a big mistake. There was a lady who was going to the Y. And she was coming out the door and her husband was behind her. And I said, you look so familiar. She said, yeah, I'm from the Y. Oh, I didn't recognize you with your clothes on. Well, that, that was not good. 
<laughs> I didn't recognize her out of the context of the why. And you see, could that have been what? No, I don't think so. You see, what Jesus had done, as he'd done to the fellows who were on the road to Emmaus, I think Jesus prevented her from recognizing her right away. Because Jesus was going to help her to see that she needed to see Jesus in a different light. Her whole spectrum about Jesus was going to be about to change. Because she was used to seeing Jesus alive and being with him. But now Jesus was going to take her to a new level in her relationship. And I believe he prevented her from seeing him at that moment. And that she needed to understand that even though she doesn't see him, that he's still with her and he's there with her all the way through life. And that she understands that. But you see, Mary was so directed toward the old way of looking at Jesus and clinging on that way that she couldn't let go. He wanted to let her know that it was not going to be a visible thing anymore, that she was going to have to see him in a different way. And she would experience a deeper relationship with him. And how many things does it happen in our own lives that block us from seeing Jesus? How many of us sometimes believe in the tangible world so much that we have a hard time believing in Jesus who's beyond the tangible world and is in a different light? How many times have you heard people say, well, if I just win the lottery, all my problems are going to be solved? <laughs> That's bull. Or when I get that new promotion, everything is going to be different and going to be great. Well, it may be a little bit more comfortable in some respects, but your problems just increase. You see, the only true joy comes is when we see Jesus and that we use and we live in Jesus and deal with life through Jesus. Otherwise, we see it crumble and we struggle. We have difficulty. You see... She, she, she jumped to too many conclusions and forgot what Jesus had to say to her. And because of it, she didn't see him. But then we have this encounter. Here's the, where she, Jesus says to her, Mary. And as soon as she hears that word, the way he says it, as Jesus had said earlier, my sheep hear my voice and know me. She recognizes Jesus. And immediately she jumps to it and says in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. She's excited to see Jesus. She identifies Jesus by the voice that he has. And she's so excited. And one of the things this tells us, folks, is that when we will be resurrected with our loved ones, our personalities remain the same. You'll be able to recognize that loved one because of who they are and how they were and how you related with them. You'll be able to recognize them. You see, and she was able to recognize by the voice and then saw Jesus. But notice what happens here. That she is then told to step beyond her emotions now, but now to step away from Jesus. Notice what Jesus says to her here in this passage. Jesus says to her, stop clinging to me. She has the Texas death hold on Jesus. She has seen him and she's not going to let go. I had my grandson give me one of those. I almost passed out one day. He grabbed me around the neck and he's choking me. Because he was glad to see me. And she was so glad to see Jesus, she was clinging. And Jesus knew what she was doing. She was clinging hard because she didn't want to let go of him ever again. She wanted to hold him. Because she missed him so much and she knew what he's meant to her. And notice what Jesus says. Stop clinging to me. Now, was Jesus had one of those people that had problems with people touching him? No. What did Jesus do later on? He says to Thomas, hey, Thomas, come on over here. You think it, put your hand in there. Try it over here. Jesus is not afraid of a touch. What Jesus was saying to her, Mary, you're trying to hang on to the old view of me. You're trying to keep me here, and this is not what it's about. I'm not going to be with you here physically much longer. But notice what he says to her. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Now, is Jesus saying I have to be clean, and so you mortal can't touch me before I go to heaven? No, he's not saying that. 
He said, but, I, to, I, but go to my brethren and tell them, I must ascend to my father and your father, my God and your God. And what Jesus is saying here to her is first Mary realized this. Because I go to the Father, because I died on the cross, my relationship to God is different than yours. I am the same essence. I'm part of the Trinity. I am the same being. And he's my Father, he's my God, differently than you, Mary. And you are, I am the same essence of him, but you are a child by adoption. Because I died on the cross, because you trust me, you now can have eternal life and live as my sister in heaven because I died for you and that he's your God and your father because you've accepted me and that I have made you a child, a daughter of adoption. And all that I have that the father has given me, which is all beyond the universe and whatnot in eternity, is yours. But then he says to her, but I need to ascend. And that our relationship is going to be different because no longer are you going to be able to physically touch me anymore and hold me like you do. But because I ascend to the Father, it's not going to be this physical touch. It's going to be much deeper. That when I go to heaven, that I'm going to send my Holy Spirit upon the earth and all believers now will have a deeper relationship because the Holy Spirit will be inside them and they will be much closer than to me than ever have in a physical form or realm. And that I promise you, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will always live inside. You see, that's what Jesus is, essence of his saying to Mary. And because if he didn't go back to heaven and ascend and send his Holy Spirit, we could not be Christians. We could not have that comfort in our hearts that the Holy Spirit lives inside us and that Jesus lives inside us through the Holy Spirit and that we don't have that power. But because Jesus ascended, because he told Mary to stop holding on to him on this earthly form and let him ascend, that is where we would have an eternal life. And tell, tell the disciples, Go and tell them what I've told you. But you have to quit clinging to the old idea of who I am. How many people do you know have such bad ideas about God and they continue to hold on to Him and they're not freed because they're, they've fallen into following untrue statements about God and untrue statements about Jesus. And they hold on to them because that's what's comfortable. But that's not the truth. Jesus wants us to hold this truth in our minds and in our hearts and that to live it, that he is with us every day and that we have to get rid of the old ways of thinking, the old ways of doing things and let him permeate our hearts so that we can have the fullness that Jesus has laid out for us on this earth and the next. Look what Paul says. He went through this whole metamorphosis. You see, because Paul's old way of thinking was, if I do, 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 and I'm religious enough, that God will accept me into heaven. But notice what he says. Finally, he realizes that's not true. And he says, I don't mean to say that I have achieved these things that have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess the perfection of which Christ Jesus first possessed for me. He says, I can do it. But the perfection that I yearned for, I was always coming up short. But now that Jesus Christ died for me and washed away my sins, I will experience that perfection because of his Holy Spirit coming in and giving me eternal life. So, no, dear brothers and sisters, he says, I do not achieve it, but I focus on one thing, forgetting all the good things I did in the past. And I look ahead to what lies before me, what Jesus has laid hold of for me. All those things, I reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus Christ, is calling me. You see, each one of us has the prize. He's calling us to do that. And we need to just let ourselves experience that and grab hold of Jesus and get rid of our old views and grab onto this Christ who's risen and conquered and living again. You see, because when that happens, new life enters in our soul. His life flows through us. And we are going to be thrilled to death as Mary. You see, Mary was so excited. She became the apostle of the apostles. She went from a mourner to a, a, a missionary, running to the disciples. And look what she does. Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. 
Last night I was here working on this sermon. And all of a sudden I get a text from New Jersey. Go shocks. <laughs> and there I was. And as the time was going by, my phone started blowing up with go shocks, go shocks. I, and finally I gave in. I said, Lord, you're going to have to help this sermon because I'm going to watch the shocks too. A little under inspiration. And I put it on my computer and there it was, you know. And I'm saying, don't do another Kansas team thing by blow that lead. Please, please. And I was watching and I was getting texts and hearing everybody from here to New Jersey and even California. A guy that used to work I, I'm in my church in New Jersey and now is a, a, is a commentator for the Sharks uh, hockey team in California texted me, go Sharks! <laughs> I am like lit up. And yet, that's the enthusiasm that Mary had. She had seen the Lord. And he had changed her thinking and her mind. And now she knows and she understands what he's talking about. And folks... That's the Jesus who comes to us. This woman that I have on the other side of the screen, her name is Anne Lamott. In fact, somebody came up to me after church and she's in a book club and she told me she was so surprised about this because this woman is a left-wing radical gal, new ager, but not anymore. Because what interestingly happened, she's a best-selling author, New York Times list, and she was put in uh, Love Walked Among Us by Paul Miller's book. And she wrote this. I didn't go to the flea market the weekend of my abortion. I stayed home and I smoked dope, got drunk. And I tried to write a little but just couldn't do it. And on the seventh night, though very drunk, I discovered that I was bleeding heavily. And I should have called the doctor, but I didn't because I was disgusted that I had gotten so drunk one week after the abortion that I couldn't even wake someone up and ask them to help me. I went to bed. I was shaky. I was sad. I was sick. I was even too wild to take another drink or take a sleeping pill. So I sat in my room with a cigarette in the dark. And after a while, I lay there, and I became aware that there was something else in this room. My dog was there, yes, but there was something else in the room. It was dark, but I knew beyond a shadow of doubt that it was Jesus. I felt him as surely as I felt my dog laying beside me. I was appalled. I thought, the big life that I have, that brilliant and hilarious and progressive friends what would they think? I thought about what everyone would think of me if I became one of those Christians. It seemed an utterly impossible thing for me. I turned to the wall and I said, I'd rather die. And after a while of tossing and turning, I fell asleep. But I knew he was watching me, sitting there, patient and loving. I squeezed my eyes to try to get him out of my, but I knew he was in my thoughts and finally fell asleep. It spooked me. In fact, the next morning I got up and I went out and I felt like a little cat was following me. Something was following me. One week later, I went to church. I was hung over. I couldn't stand the songs. I stayed for the sermon and I thought, how ridiculous it is that someone is trying to convince me of the existence of extraterrestrials. But at last, the last song came and it was deep, raw and pure. I couldn't escape it any longer. I felt as though God's presence was right there, washing over me. I began to cry and I raced home and I still felt that little cat just pounding me on my heels. I opened the door to my house and I stood there for a long minute and then I hung my head and said, I quit. I took a brief breath and said, all right, 
Come on in. Jesus brings new life. And that day he brought, to you, he brought it to Anne. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. She experienced new life. From that old, powerful life of sin and killing herself through new life in Christ. You see, it all begins when we step in to the resurrection of Christ, to being with Him and, and allowing Him to enter into our life through the Holy Spirit, that we step over and go beyond our emotions and step up beyond those emotions to seeing Jesus who He is real, really is as He's portrayed in the Scriptures, the real Jesus, and that we step away from old images of the way we try to control God and now let Him take full control over us. It's then that it happens that we feel and sense that we can then step out and really let the world know the power of Jesus in our lives and to tell the world. You see, that's what happens when we're born again, when we're new. When Jesus, through His Holy Spirit, enters into our hearts and takes our brokenness and builds new life. For David Bloom, we hear about his life. I was interested in reading about it. You don't read this much in the secular papers or in the magazines, but to understand that as he was getting ready to go to Iraq that last time, he seemed preoccupied with his spiritual life. And David Bloom learned that he could worship God and that he learned to love Jesus more than he ever had before in his life. And that he let his family know. He started talking to them about Jesus more and more at the kitchen table and about their bedtime prayers. And then he confided in his pastor one night. He said, I'm almost afraid to say it, but I'm ready. And when the priest asked him whether he was afraid because he knew that maybe God might take him on this trip, he just nodded. While he was over there, he wrote his last email to his wife. And this is what it said. Because she had seen him on TV, the girls had seen him, watching him as they were broadcasting from Iraq. And this is what it said. Yes, I'm proud of the good job we're doing over here. But in the scheme of things, it matters little. Compared to my relationship with you, the girls, and Jesus Christ. Folks, that's what it's about. And because he's risen, the hope that Melanie and those three girls know that they will see dad and their husband again is the same joy and wonderful blessing of familiarity that we'll see our loved ones in Jesus because he rose from the dead and that we can be different that our emotions no longer have to take control of us and that we can step beyond ourselves and be the people who Jesus wants us to be that's what he calls us to today as he is the risen 